Strictly speaking, the nucleus is not a drop of charged liquid. And therefore, the nuclear matter is not structureless. It is not amorphous or anisotropic, like a drop of liquid. But if this is so, then the nuclear analogy of a liquid drop leaves us with a question of the existence of elements with atomic numbers above 100. What do I mean when I say not a drop? Not a drop means that it has its own structure inside the substance. What structure am I referring to? Let's take a look. All the experimental points that are drawn here show the mass of the nucleus, or more precisely, its mass defect. From the lightest, to the heaviest, which is uranium and even transuranic elements. And this line shows the calculation of the liquid drop model. It is very clearly depicted. We will be meticulous and look at the difference between a point that is an experiment and the line that describes it. And we will highlight this difference at the top, and here it is drawn at the top. Here, of course, there are different scales. The x-axis consists of tens of mega electron volt, and the y-axis consists of just mega electron volt. But we see here that, of course, there is an uneven line, and here there are large deviations. Sometimes the forces that hold the nucleus together turn out to be much stronger than in a drop. Sometimes the binding energy is less than in a drop. And these nuclei, which are more bound than in a drop, do not depend on some average values, but depend on a specific mass, on a specific number of protons and neutrons. This is an experiment. You need to understand how this fits into the drip analogy. And then we will call it a kind of amendment. I will say in advance that we call it a shell correction. And I will show you why. Strutinsky took up the calculation of this shell correction amendment. Here we have Mizuchka, then Sobichevsky, then Garev. And they each had their own approach. What is stability? First, you need to define the concept. This is where a specific energy level system comes into play. There is a potential well of energy that is full. All nucleons, according to Paul's principles, are within these energy levels. And finally, we come to the Fermi surface. Here it is. And then, these are stable nuclei. We will further excite them, and then we will have new levels, and then the system can move to higher levels. The question is, how many levels are there? If these levels are frequently distributed, then it is easy to pass these levels. And if they are infrequently distributed, then it becomes more difficult. The one that remains still is stable, and the one that easily turns into an excited state is unstable. Therefore, in principle, the binding energy of the nucleus can be associated with these levels, and the levels can be considered as the motion of particles, the field of the nucleus, in one approximation or another. And here's how the nuclei differ from each other. For example, if we look at the nucleus of lead, then the next level is here, the next is here, the next is here. And this is the nucleus of, say, holmium. Here, the levels only go up to 54. The nuclei are very different. And this difference must be taken into account when we talk about whether the nucleus is stable or unstable or how this or that structure works. So, there are nuclei that are stable, as I showed you, 
and they are more stable than the drop model predicted. Physicists love beautiful names, and they called them magic. There are nuclei that have such a number of protons and neutrons that the binding energy of these protons and neutrons is greater than that of neighboring nuclei. This nucleus, which has this number of protons or this number of neutrons, is called magic. And the magic effect itself is called the shell effect. Personally, I don't like this name, but there is nothing to be done about that. That is, they have some semblance to the shells of an atom when we have, say, the eighth period of the periodic chart of elements where noble gases are located, where eight electrons are closed and closed structures are created, making these atoms stable and therefore they do not enter into chemical reactions because they have no loose bonds, they are all occupied. These are, in principle, magical atoms, or magic atoms. Chemists call them, more amiably, noble, and therefore noble gases. Noble gases are neon, this is argon, this is krypton, this is xenon, and this is radon, and the recently discovered element 118 is also a noble gas. Therefore, there are such nuclei in which there is this shell effect. I must tell you that this, of course, is a very rough approximation, because on one hand there is the closure of electrons, the shells of electrons, which are at a huge distance from the nucleus, and on the other hand is the shell, which is in the nucleus itself, where protons and neutrons are in close proximity of one another, since the nucleus has a high density. Remember to keep the Rutherford-Bohr model in mind. When I say the nuclear shell effect, I mean the effect that adds stability to the nucleus. We can say that additional bond forces in the nucleus, binding a specific number of protons and neutrons, creates this system which is more connected than any other system. Looking at this famous graph of all the nuclei, we can see the protons and neutrons. These are the magic numbers. For protons, they are 2 protons, 8 protons, 20 protons, 28 protons, 50 protons, and 82 protons. For neutrons, they are also 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. These are the very nuclei that are at the intersection at which the number of protons and the number of neutrons are magic, and they are called doubly magic. That is helium, this is oxygen, calcium-40, calcium-48, nickel-56, nickel-78, tin-100, tin-132, and lead-208. Lead-208 is the last stable nucleus. There is a lot of lead, because it is doubly magic. If it had not been doubly magic, it would have been radioactive, and it would not have been in the ground. But this is not what interests us right now, although we are interested in what is coming next.